this presentation is uh, the imperatives must go. Um, I'm hoping to uh, pick your interest with uh, uh, this title. And we're going to spend uh, the next hour together exploring uh, some of the uh, ideas around um, um, programming paradigms and how we can um, change the way we think and the way we structure our, our programs. And um, a bit about myself, um, I've always worked um, building tools for developers. I've built um, tools for um, IT pros and admins for packaging for a lot of years. Uh, I built open source tools. And uh, recently I joined the Visual C++ team uh, at Microsoft. Again, um, building towards improving the tools I've been using for uh, almost 20 years now. So a very warm, warm welcome from the Visual C++ team to all CppCon 2020 attendees. Uh, please join the, the, the Discord. We have a dedicated channel. Um, do take a survey. We always run a survey around CppCon time uh, for uh, the C++ community. And um, as uh, administrative uh, issues, do ask questions as we go along. Uh, feel free to um, uh, post comments as well. Uh, I don't mind. I'll try to keep an eye on the Q&A tab uh, in Zoom. And I'll do just questions uh, as we go along uh, where possible. Uh, or, and uh, if not, I'll defer questions to the end. Uh, first of all, this is meant as uh, an introductory presentation to the concepts that will follow. Uh, I'm going to touch uh, upon a few subjects related to uh, programming paradigms and uh, functional programming a bit and the relationship with uh, our world, our, our, our imperative world of C++. And depending on how this presentation lands, uh, sequels will cover um, more of these topics uh, in depth. Um, but don't worry, um, there will be no cliffhangers uh, at the end. So um, this, the idea here is that uh, for the next hour, I'm hoping to uh, pick your interest uh, in some of these ideas. And I have plenty of resources to um, uh, guide you uh, after the presentation, uh, my slides have uh, lots of and lots of links to articles and books and uh, video presentations, and you can drill down um, further if you're interested in a particular uh, topic that I'm going to cover. Uh, fair warning: uh, some ideas might might feel a bit uh, radical, um, but um, take it as it is. Uh, so these are not rules, uh, not even guidelines. There's just some ideas to get you inspired to think differently. So let's get started. Um, FP in 10. Uh, at least I'm going to try uh, uh, a quick uh, crash course in, in a, uh, functional programming and um, some of these ideas. Uh, what is it all about, functional programming? Well, it's a lot of things, a lot of concepts uh, to get our heads around. Some of them uh, might feel familiar because uh, we've seen them around in different programming languages, in different incarnations. Some of them might feel weird or mysterious. Um, some of them might feel scary or too abstract, too mathematical. Um, uh, either way, uh, all have the right place and usefulness in all contexts and in all programming languages, not just in traditional uh, pure uh, FP languages. So we're going to touch upon uh, a few of these today and see how we can um, use them to um, build uh, more intuitive um, abstractions, and more intuitive programs. But we have to deal with a, a, a kind of a paradox of programming. And here I'm going to channel uh, Bartosz Milewski, who strongly influenced uh, my, my learning in terms of um, programming techniques and, and 
functional programming and mathematical rigor in general uh, when thinking about programming. Uh, we, we have a, a, a strong mismatch uh, in, in, in how we function as humans and how we think and how we structure uh, uh, thinking and design in our heads and how uh, the machines we use to program uh, function. Uh, they are very different on, on several levels. For example, humans generally uh, tend to do uh, global analysis and analyze things uh, as uh, holes, as systems, uh, whereas machines deal with local data and local computation uh, that is sequenced in some way or another. So uh, that would be a first uh, impedance mismatch there. Uh, again, humans are more goal-oriented. Uh, we want to achieve a result. We want to compute the minimum something from a collection, or we want to sort something, or we want the top 10 from a collection or something. So we have goals, uh, whereas machines uh, deal in, in, in increments, in progress. They deal in, in small operations that build towards that goal, uh, but they never see a higher level goal. Uh, in, in this processing. So uh, again, the contrast comes from the, the fact that we have an idea uh, of what we want to achieve, uh, whereas machines have details. Uh, and we have a limited memory uh, and, and things about what we can reason uh, at a given time, uh, when, even when we try to comprehend a, a complicated uh, architecture, a complicated program, whereas machines have a limited memory of basically. And we are very error prone, of course. Um, and uh, the thing that we developed over thousands of years uh, is a universal language to deal with this, uh, as opposed to programming languages, which are rather new. Uh, and this universal reasoning language is the language of mathematics. And it's uh, maybe not something that everyone wants to hear, but uh, if you want to build uh, rigor in, in logic and, uh, and, and how we think about um, composing operations and uh, architecting uh, algorithms, we have to think in terms of mathematical rigor. So uh, we, we have to, to reconcile this, this mismatch between us and the machines that we're trying to program. And uh, the semantics plays a very important role. And this is where things really get lost in translation, where we uh, try to encode uh, our semantics and ideas into programs that uh, sometimes tend to be very low level. So um, this is where things start to sometimes cause problems uh, in the way we uh, think uh, about semantics of operations that we try to, to uh, simulate and uh, what the, the program actually encodes. So sometimes this is surprising because uh, we, we fool ourselves in, in thinking that uh, the, the model that we built reflects the semantics that we desire. But uh, sometimes uh, our abstractions are, are, are very leaky and uh, the semantics are not really carried over. And sometimes we even surprise our colleagues or ourselves uh, later on because we, we fail to encode proper semantics in the programs we design. We just encode the details. So uh, I would say functional programming is not about a particular programming language that is uh, specifically designed uh, for functional programming. It's about more about a style of programming. It's about um, a style of programming where um, the basic method of computation is function application. And uh, any programming language that supports a functional style uh, can be used in this way. So we don't have to uh, always go to a traditional um, pro uh, functional programming languages or esoteric uh, academic um, prototypes or programming languages. So all programming languages have uh, constructs that allow us to use a functional style. But we have to address the elephant in the room, and that is Haskell, because 
of course, everyone thinks about that when we talk about FP and uh, all um, major ideas have percolated uh, for years and Haskell uh, would be the industry pinnacle for uh, all these uh, functional style concepts that we, we see in, in other places. So uh, what do I mean by a functional style? Uh, I mean, um, I mean, um, I, I think we have a slight lag in the audio. I'm hoping it gets resolved. Um, I mean, um, the difference between, for example, if you think about traditional C family languages like C++, Java, C Sharp, whatever, uh, where we think the, the computation method is variable assignment, uh, in, 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 function, in a functional style, the computation method is function application. So we clearly express intent that we want to sum up a range of integers rather than uh, displaying the mechanics of how we want to achieve that goal. So uh, this is what I mean by functional style, not necessarily uh, syntax uh, or language. So it's more about... Um, the functional style is about what we're trying to accomplish and not about the details, whereas a non-functional or pure uh, imperative procedural approach is about uh, dealing with the, the details of how we achieve uh, this, all the uh, messy bits and what we have to tell the machine to actually um, perform those low-level operations because machines cannot perform high-level commands. So... I think uh, Michael Feathers uh, had a, a, a solid summary of uh, this contrast, uh, especially to, to, towards uh, object-oriented programming, which seems to be the, the mainstream uh, paradigm or way of programming these days uh, in most programming languages. Uh, uh, object-oriented makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts, uh, we all know this, we know the, the solid principles um, and the, the best practices around building uh, OO code. Um, whereas uh, functional programming style makes code understandable by minimizing the moving parts. So eliminating the ceremony, eliminating uh, boilerplate syntax, uh, assignments, statements, uh, variables and, and such. So I think that's a fair summary. Um, I always like to, to take a, a historical route um, and um, I, I like to highlight the important people uh, that, uh, we, uh, that helped build the, the ideas that I'm presenting and uh, we have to acknowledge them and know our history and uh, the, the giants on, uh, on the shoulders we stand. So, uh, and it's important because most of the new ideas and innovations in modern programming languages are actually fairly old um, compared to our field, of course. Um, so no, they're not actually actually new things. Uh, we just rediscovered them. Um, starting in, in, the, in the 1930s, uh, Alonzo Church develops lambda calculus, a simple but powerful theory of functions. This is where we get the, the lambda uh, the Lambda name, um, uh, Walter E. Brown has a very interesting uh, anecdotal story in one of his presentations about how we got the, the Lambda word from, uh, I won't spoil the detail, just watch the talk. Um, going further in the 50s, uh, John McCarthy develops Lisp, the first functional programming language with some influences from Lambda calculus, of course, but retaining uh, variable assignments. A, a strongly influential language. In the 60s, later on, Peter Landin develops uh, ISWEIM, the first pure function language based on strongly on lambda calculus, but with no with no assignments. So we we have uh, refinements and, and uh, various attempts. Uh, less known, uh, John Backus develops FP, a functional. Uh, language that emphasizes higher order functions and reasoning about programs. Uh, usually, when when, when I think people think about Vacuus, they think about Fortran. 
but uh, later on, uh, he was strongly involved in, in exploring uh, functional programming ideas and higher order functions. Um, Robin Milner develops ML, the first functional language which introduced type inference and polymorphic types. Again, strongly influential. Um, in the 70s and 80s, we have the Miranda system and a new idea uh, percolates the idea of uh, lazy functional languages, lazy evaluation. And um, uh, we have a, a, a pinnacle of all these ideas um, being reached um, in Haskell, uh, where we standardize uh, uh, a way of uh, encoding all these uh, concepts in a single language. And uh, later on, a few important additions that we recognize in, in other programming languages as well today, uh, a thing that really changed uh, how we express uh, abstractions. Uh, Phil Wadler uh, develops the idea of type classes and monads, uh, and this is what uh, Haskell is best known for today. Um, and this is what scares most people too. Uh, and um, of course, the there of course there is a, a XKCD about this. Uh, if if Haskell is so great, uh, why isn't everyone using it? So, if code written in Haskell is guaranteed to have no side effects, it's because no one will ever run it. Well, Haskell is used in, in industry, uh, actually, but I'm not going to focus on that because uh, I'm not trying to sell you Haskell. Um, uh, yeah, my, my claim is that uh, Haskell has taken over the world, but not in, in the sense that uh, everyone is using it, um, but in, in the idea that um, small features, uh, small uh, or some significant features in, in some programming languages have 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 percolated in 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 modern mainstream programming languages and they, the ideas come from from haskell so um, haskell has come to dominate some of the, the 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 ideas that we have and consider modern in some programming languages not just c++ uh uh, but they, they, they're actually ideas that um, uh, were developed in, in, in the FP branch of programming languages that culminates with Haskell, of course. So functional programming, programming ideas have been around for over 40 years now, and we keep rediscovering them and trying to adapt them to our programming languages that we use currently. Uh, we try to retrofit Sometimes it works, sometimes it's not that um, great. Uh, sometimes legacy or syntax or ceremony um, doesn't help uh, or it's not appropriate for some of these concepts. So uh, hit and miss, but we're trying and we see value. The, 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 the reason we keep trying is because we keep, seeing, we keep seeing values in these concepts. And indeed, contemporary C++ has become more functional. And this is my thesis for today, uh, trying to show you that C++ is more functional. Uh, from mundane concepts like lambdas and closures uh, and functions, encapsulating functions and passing fun functions around as values, uh, value types and, and immutability, uh, composability of STL algorithms, uh, lazy ranges, folding, mapping, partial application, higher order functions, and even monads, yeah, <laughs> even monads. Um, just a bit of taste, just uh, very quickly, uh, a quick taste of Haskell. Um, if I were in the room with uh, the audience, uh, I would ask uh, if folks see what this function might be, um, but I'm gonna skip that. Uh, it's actually a quick sort, and it's a very succinct way of expressing quick sort. Uh, I don't think I've seen a, a way of expressing quick sort sh uh, in a more concise way in any programming language. It just uh, it just encodes the the idea that we want to uh, re um, 
recursively partition ranges that are uh, based on values that are smaller or greater than 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 what we're pivoting. So it, it's very very succinct, and uh, I try to draw here a, a visualization of um, how the steps of the the computation happen, uh, and we get the the sorted range out of this. Uh, simple and concise way. Uh, it ties in together with the, the idea that I mentioned earlier around intent and specifying the intent to uh, repeatedly partition the range in smaller and larger values rather than uh, spending all the ceremony around um, orchestrating this computation. And if we contrast that with um, pseudo code, so um, it's uh, this is not any particular programming language is sort of like more like pseudo code here. Uh, it, it it quickly gets complicated uh, if you want to think about the details. And yes, the, the devil is in the details here because uh, it, it's it's pretty hard to implement a solid uh, quick sort uh, that covers all the edge cases and is uh, efficient, of course. Um, a true story, uh, in uh, 1986, Donald Knuth was asked to implement a program for the programming purse column in uh, ACM journal. And the test was very simple. Read a file of text, determine the n most frequently used words, and print them out sorted uh, along with their frequencies. Uh, kind of like a standard uh, interview questions these days. Uh, and his solution, he was a very thorough programmer, uh, his solution written in Pascal at that time uh, was uh, almost 10 pages long. Um, and uh, about at the same time, uh, Doug McElroy uh, of um, Unix fame, um, I feel that uh, a lot of folks uh, that I speak with uh, don't know Doug uh, McElroy. And it's a shame. Uh, I put a Wikipedia link there. Uh, uh, he he was the head of um, Bell Labs and had uh, a lot of contributions to uh, the Unix system and a lot of ideas and utilities uh, that stem from there, um, including the famous pipe we like so much today. And here's the same program in a six-line shell script that accomplishes the same thing uh, that Knut's 10-page Pascal program did. Again, to contrast the ideas of expressing goals and using composable utilities that pipe through the process, the pipeline, the, the processing, rather than dealing with the minutia of orchestrating variable assignments and uh, statements. And uh, it's all about pipelines in, in this regard, and I'm going to keep coming back to this again and again. Uh, so taking inspiration from Dag McElroy, um, with uh, his Unix show script uh, that is so succinct and beautiful. Um, I, I raise a challenge uh, for folks to try to solve the very same problem, but in a, in a, in a macro role style uh, in any programming language. Um, and first questions I usually get asked uh, from folks that uh, begin being interested in, in learning more about uh, uh, FP ideas and uh, playing around with them and uh, exploring them in, in their language of choice um, is the, how do I start? Um, and yes, I, I read uh, a few books on this, uh, lots of good tutorials out there and videos. I, I already mentioned uh, uh, Bartosz Milewski's uh, treasure trove of, of good presentations. If you just Google uh, his name, uh, just about any uh, presentation he's done in the past, I don't know, eight, 10 years uh, would be around this topic of uh, uh, using uh, functional abstractions uh, to build programs. Uh, and of course, you have to start with category theory for programmers. Yes, right. Uh, but not that one, rather this one. It's a very good book, but I, I, I don't recommend actually starting with this one. Uh, uh, this one is actually free. It's a free, uh, in digit, free in digital form uh, or print order. 
uh, but I actually recommend something that is closer to C++ because the, the category theory for, for programming is, a, is a, an abstract book and it, it generally leans on, on Haskell for ex, exploring the ideas. Uh, but uh, I always think about how can we actually use uh, and learn these ideas and play with these concepts, but in, in a familiar context. How is this useful for me in C++? What can I uh, do uh, in C++ to, to play with these concepts? How does it help me in my day-to-day -day, uh, experience? Because I'm not a Haskell programmer. Uh, and I do recommend this book uh, by my friend Ivan, uh, Functional Programming in C++, which is a very approachable book, uh, very um, demo-oriented, very example-oriented, uh, not a lot of theory, um, and um, short, understandable code snippets that you can walk through with very good explanations uh, to explore a lot of concepts, a lot of functional programming concepts uh, in pure C++. Uh, so um, I highly recommend this book to anyone who wants to explore this uh, subject further. I keep coming back to this book uh, again and again. Uh, and I'm going to try to um, walk through some, some, of, some of these uh, uh, FP ideas together and uh, see uh, how they can change the way we write uh, C++. So yes, even for C++. And I'm going to start with something that I feel it's easier to, to uh, grasp, but uh, uh, seldom seen uh, directly uh, fleshed out uh, as an idea. And that is lifting. Um, and I have to mention uh, a few helpers uh, for this. Uh, the, uh, for Boost fans, there is uh, Boost Hof for higher order functions, because we're going to talk about higher order functions. Uh, or uh, uh, another library that I like a lot, uh, from uh, my friend Bjorn, uh, it's called Lift. I have a link here on GitHub. It's a C++ 17 uh, compatible library for simple context per high order functions uh, and helps with composition. Uh, and I, I feel it's it, even if you're not going to use it directly, it's a good way to start learning about the concepts and play around with them. Uh, you're going to see high order functions such as uh, these ones. Uh, when all, when any, compose, uh, if then, and so on. Uh, so it, it's interesting to, to play around with them. To, even if you're limiting yourself to just some examples, I think there's value in, in, in playing with, with the ideas and understanding how high-order functions work, how you pass around functions to other functions to compose uh, algorithms. Uh, just a, a simple example here uh, where we... Uh, have um, two sort of projection projection functions, select name and select number uh, on a structure. And, uh, and uh, we implement a sort uh, routine for sorting uh, these elements by name. And we use lift compose and we provided a, a, a predicate, which is less in this, uh, uh, this time, and uh, another function, which is the projection we want. We, we want to sort uh, employees by name, so we provide the proper projection function here. And uh, another example, we use the find if algorithm. And again, we use this uh, lift compose function, which is a higher order functions, and provide uh, a predicate and another projection. For example, when we're interested in just uh, the number field from this structure. And so on. Just very simple examples to uh, get the idea of what it means to compose functions and pass around functions to other functions. Uh, and we've seen this already. We, we already have such high order functions, even in the STL. So it shouldn't feel so strange to us. But somehow we, we don't leverage the full power of, uh, of uh, this kind of composition. Um, and if you're already using C++ 20 ranges, um, you, you get this and, and so much more uh, things like projections and, and so much more. 
Uh, and again, I'm going to come back to C++ 20 ranges uh, in a few slides. Um, again, uh, from uh, the lift library from Bjorn Faller again, uh, a, a, a nice little uh, helper macro uh, that uh, forces the arguments and, in, and uses the, the, the lifting function, accomplishes the lift operation here. I, I, I think it's in, very instructive to, to, to look at how this is built and uh, how we can use it. For example, in, in this situation, we're using this macro to lift an overload set of functions. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a function which is by name uh, lifted because uh, we we might have multiple multiple functions that uh, we have an overload set, multiple, multiple functions with different kinds of arguments here. And we can very cleverly use this uh, nifty, uh, nifty lifting macro to uh, lift all the overload set functions and use a transform like this. So I, I find this kind of uh, trick um, uh, interesting and um, it, it teaches us to, to think differently, actually. Uh, if you want to dive more and see uh, more examples and rationale, I highly recommend uh, the presentation from the, the library author, uh, from Bjorn Faller, High Order Functions for Ordinary C++ Developers. I consider it already a classic and I recommend it to uh, everyone. Um, next up, uh, boxes. I'm going to talk about boxes. Uh, and it's related to, to lifting, so uh, stay with me. Uh, but first, uh, before we get into boxes, we have to see some examples of uh, various ways to hide a value uh, in a context, in a box, what I like to call a box. Um, some of the usual suspects, unique pointer, Shared pointer, vector, optional, function, uh, all the standard, all these standard types are actually uh, boxes, wrappers, and they all have ways of uh, picking at the, or getting the value within in various ways. For example, for, for standard function would be function application to get the value. Um, and I'm assuming there's no side effects here. So I'm assuming a, a pure function for simplicity, of course. So uh, we have a way to wrap a value and a way to get the value out of this box. And let's see how we can uh, think about this. And uh, this is where some of the uh, terminology comes into play and uh, might scare some folks off uh, these ideas because they have very fancy names and fancy explanations. But I find... Uh, 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 I find it very approachable. <laughs> uh, there's a series of blog posts uh, uh, that I linked here. Uh, there's a series of three or four blog posts which have excellent explanations using um, um, images and, and very simple uh, examples that we can uh, go through to understand very complicated mathematical concepts such as applicative and monads. And the idea is that uh, you want to perform, getting back to, to our wrapper, to our context, to our box, we want to perform these actions on the hidden value without breaking the box, without peeking at the value. So we have, we have to have some kind of magic uh, of uh, un unwrapping the, the value out from the context, applying the function and putting it back in, in its original context. And we want all this thing to happen uh, invisibly to the programmer. So uh, at, at the level of the, the main program where we actually construct our, our logic for, for our computation, uh, we, we don't want to leak this, this idea that we, we, we pick inside the box. So we have to have a means of applying a function, applying a transformation to, to the value that we suppose it's in the box, but it may not be there. And we, we apply the, the operation and we carry on along carry on the, the transform value along with its context. So we, we don't we never carry on the, the value itself. We carry a context that might have a value. And we keep transforming it. So these are very powerful ideas, and these ideas is 
uh, help a lot when we think about composing operations and, and streamline the, the logic in our program. And I'm going to show you concrete examples. So um, one example I, I alluded earlier is uh, about is standard optional, which is a, this kind of a box. And the idea is don't look inside the box, don't use optional for error handling and such. Um, and of course, yeah, draw inspiration from Haskell maybe or Rust option, which are the, the same idea. Uh, and we have to think in terms of FMAP. And I'm, I'm going to try to explain what FMAP is. And I'm going to try to show various flavors of FMAP in C++. So when, you think, when we think about optional, it's best not to think about, let me check the value inside it, rather than let's see what transformation I can apply on top of that optional what can I F map onto it uh, and continue my computation without picking inside? Um, so the idea is uh, if we're going to change some functions around that uh, get uh, optionals as arguments and return optionals, maybe the idea is not to pick inside and branch conditionally if we have a value or not and do something differently or uh, check we, if we have a value and, 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 maybe react in some way. So uh, the idea is uh, pass along the optional and transform the value, compound to it uh, until we're done with what we're trying to achieve and then we see if we have uh, a result or not. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm coming back to, to these uh, uh, images uh, and I strongly encourage you for folks that are unfamiliar with concepts like uh, applicative or fmap or uh, with monads in general. I'm not going to try to explain uh, how burritos work. Uh, I strongly encourage you to read these articles that I've linked here, and I think they do a great job of explaining complicated concepts in simple ways. But I'm going to give some examples. Uh, for example, uh, calling a function on a string value inside an optional box. So let's say we have a capitalized function that takes a string and returns a string. And we have some kind of operation that could fail and should return a string if successful. Otherwise, we have a, a null opt there. So we encapsulate this in an optional string. Uh, and we have to apply this capitalized function to the string, to, to this string value that might be or might not be there. So uh, in order to be able to call the value function from the option, we check explicitly if we have the value there or not. Exactly what I told you, don't pick in the box. Uh, so uh, the idea is that, uh, first of all, we have to continue to deal with this in terms of keeping it in the box. So don't try to materialize it. Don't try to see if we have a string there. So continue using uh, an optional and uh, even better it, the, the idea that is essential here is to lift the concept, lift the function. So we have to lift the capitalized function to another function that instead of working from a string to a string as domain and codomain, it should work uh, from, I have a comment here, Schrodinger's cat programming. Don't look, don't look in the box. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> true. True. So uh, the idea here is that uh, we have to have, think in terms of a different function that the lifted capitalized we takes an option takes an optional string and returns an optional string, and inside it can do all, all this messy business of calling the our primitive our API that deals with pure strings with real strings, but uh, in, it encapsulates this idea it lifts away the the concept from the string domain and codomain to optional string, to box of string. And uh, I, I try to visualize here the, the idea of uh, domain and codomain of each function. So instead of thinking in terms of strings, we have to think in terms of the boxes. Uh, so our optional string. And this is where we uh, first uh, would encounter an FMAP kind of primitive, um, a simple example here, uh, where we, I implemented an, an FMAP that takes an optional A and returns an optional B and uses a function from A to B. That this, this is the C++ syntax for standard function signature here. 
So a function from A to B and takes a, an option A and returns an option B. And inside it just applies the, the, the given function. So this is our lifted uh, function. Our lifted function does this transformation. So this is the, our first encounter with fmap. So lifting any function from A to codomain B means uh, putting uh, a lifted function, equivalent lifted function from box of A to box of B, option of A, option of B. So um, if we want, for example, we want to combine, because I said the promise here was that uh, the idea of, uh, of boxing helps with function composition and using such the transformations uh, actually uh, amends itself to uh, composing uh, several such things. And the idea is here to combine a trim function and a length function. So first we want to trim a string and then compute its length. And we do two subsequent uh, fmap operations. And we have a lifted trim equivalent to our trim and a lifted length. So I think you, you get the idea. Uh, we have a sequential composition of lifted functions. And taking it even further, uh, um, instead of using standard function, we can use uh, a template type, template callable here and achieve the same results. So this would be a, a different flavor of fmap if you prefer the, something like this. Um, another example, let's say we want to build a symbol table or debugger or something like that. And we have, let's say we have a function address, current program counter, and we have a, a function load symbol, uh, which uh, gets this program counter, which might not be there and returns, if possible, returns uh, an, an address of a function uh, or something like that. And then we have a like, two string facility that can uh, display a function name or something. Let's say we're building a stack trace utility or something similar. Uh, again, the same idea is uh, in, in this case, we're actually checking if we have the option, did the operation succeed? Yeah, succeed, okay, then we can move along and call the other function. This, this is not the greatest way to compose. Again, if we go back to our fmap, we can do two fmaps uh, on top of each other. The first fmap, the inner one, goes from the program counter and calls the load symbol function, which actually deals in concrete types. So this would be an API kind of thing that doesn't deal in terms of optional. And uh, the optional result from this F mapping is passed further along to the outer F map along with the another API function that doesn't know how to deal with optionals. And we compose them and we get an optional out. And then, uh, we might peak at the value after we're, we're done with all the composition and processing. So that's the, the idea. And we, we can imagine even something like a, a pipe syntax, which would be more like a syntactic sugar for the same thing in very similar to, to ranges, let's say. And um, another example, for example, uh, another kind of box, because I, I uh, kept obsessing about optional, because it's very useful. Uh, but another kind of uh, such box is vector. So if we, th if we think another kind of F map would be standard transform as an algorithm. Again, this is a higher order function. It takes a function as an argument. And we can think about writing an F map from a vector of A's to a vector of B's because we're we want to transform stuff. Uh, and we have a lifted function. Our lifted function is our F map function here. So it, 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 instead of going from A to B, like the argument function that we receive, it goes from vector of A to vector of B. And let's say we want to compute some string lengths. We have a vector of strings and we want a vector of lengths, which are integers. We can use this fmap function to achieve this in a single shot. And we don't have to deal with, do we have a string? Do we, uh, we don't have a string or anything like that. So. Uh, to recap, um, we have type constructors that help us create a box that wraps another type. 
things like unique pointer, optional vector, and so on. And the idea is it, it wraps a value in a context. And the value might be there or might not be there. Uh, and we have function lifting, which is a very important concept. And we can create higher order functions such as fmap and others. And uh, we can create lifting operations that change the domain and codomain of our functions and help us compose such operations to deal in terms of context processing rather than value processing. And the idea is that uh, we don't need to break encapsulation, no picking in the box, and we achieve better composition through chaining and continuation. And we have uh, an even better facility, which is right in the box, pun intended, uh, starting with uh, C++23. Uh, and these are monadic extensions to standard optionals. And a simple example here, let's say we have a, a string view to int function that tries to transform a string representation to an integer representation. And of course, it might fail because that might not be a number. And uh, let's say we want to do something with this transformation. So we have string view to int, and this one might return an actual int or not, because it returns an optional. And we chain continuations on, on, on the end of this. And this is how we do it. And then, and then we take a lambda, which you turn, in turn returns another optional and does something, does some logic here and checking some log counts and so on. And then chains another transformation. On top of that, we have a transform, another lambda. And uh, in case of error, we can do something like log or something like that. And at the end, see if we can extract the value. So uh, this is, this is a, a way of structuring computation so that it feels linear uh, and not some weird callbacks hell or uh, very complicated uh, um, flags or state machines that we have to deal with uh, in terms of variables. We, we, we compose things as if sequential. Uh, so it's like a pipeline processing. Uh, so I do strongly encourage, and I think this way of programming encourages a very declarative style. And uh, I very much like to program this way. I want to force myself to to program more in this style. Uh, I highly recommend this presentation by Ben Dean uh, uh, about uh, using declarative style in C++. I think there's lots. I picked one of my favorite slides from the presentation, but uh, the, the presentation is full of uh, great ideas, and I highly recommend it. The link is in the slide here. Uh, and I, I want to uh, draw your attention to values now and the fact that um, expressions yield values and statements do not. And we tend to focus a lot of st on statements in, in C++ and, and, and in variables. And we think we have to think more in terms of expressions and values. And we have related sessions that I'm, I'm so eager to see. I, I'm, uh, I'm dying with anticipation. Uh, from Dave Abrahams, uh, it's just plainly called values. It's about safety, regularity, independence, projection, and the future of programming. Highly, highly recommend this session. I cannot wait to see it. Um, past sessions that I learned a lot from, uh, uh, you're going to see a lot of recommendations from me uh, of presentations by Juan Pedro Bolivar Puente. Um, first up, uh, that about value semantics, the most valuable values. Uh, highly inspired presentation. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, about it's all about value value oriented design and how you reconcile functional and procedural programming by focusing on value semantics um, and how it promotes uh, local reasoning and composition um, and it, it tries to ground itself in in, in reality in terms of okay, these ideas sound excellent, but how can I use them in my legacy C++ code base? And I think uh, uh, Juanpe always tries to ground the, the revolutionary ideas that uh, come from Im immutable data structures and FP techniques. He, try, uh, he tries to ground them in, in how can I apply this now in 
a legacy C++ code base. What can I do? What can I um, uh, steal and use today? Um, another presentation, um, a value-oriented design in an object-oriented system. I think it, uh, this one focuses a lot on, on this idea of uh, retrofitting uh, uh, such concepts in, in legacy code bases. Uh, an, an, an older one, uh, but I think a more radical one, around uh, immutable data structures. Uh, again, uh, if you have the time, I think it's well worth it to explore it. I very much enjoy this one. Uh, but be careful in, in C++ world. Uh, might be tempted to think in terms of immutability too, too much uh, and just sprinkling cost all over the place and, uh, doesn't always help. Sometimes it hinders performance uh, quite a, a lot. So we have to be careful. Uh, watch out for uh, guidelines that um, uh, Jason explains in this uh, C++ weekly episode. I'm not going to go in, de in details, but I highly recommend that you see it's a very short episode and um, watch out for <laughs> the perils of uh, sprinkling const uh, where not appropriate. And of course, I promised uh, ranges, C++ 20 ranges. Uh, everyone is excited about this. Uh, and I, I very much like to entitle this section the beginning of the end for begin end, although I'm a strong believer in that uh, iterators are still around and still a very, very useful concept to be used. And uh, they're not going to be deprecated by ranges. Um, and ranges are all about uh, adapters and pipelines and views and projections and lazy evaluations, all these ideas should be familiar by now. Uh, all these ideas come from uh, the, the function programming lineage of programming languages and techniques. And, um, and ranges have brought them in a big way to contemporary C++. And that's why we need to care about this concept. Uh, just a quick taste of ranges for folks that are not yet uh, comfortable or familiar with them. Very simple, very toy-like examples just to get a flavor for um, um, uh, uh, an imperative style, uh, a very um, variable-oriented, very action-oriented style on the left, that would be your old style C++, and the very declarative uh, functional style C++ on the right, uh, where we actually use ranges. Uh, and you can clearly see uh, it's much more expressive and, and uh, uh, related to what I said earlier, it it, it delivers the intent of the, the program, the semantics, not the, the mechanics of the implementation. Um, just very simple, simple toy-like examples, just to show a, a taste of what it means to compose uh, such, um, uh, such functions. And, to, to, and, and the implementation is highly efficient because all the evaluations are lazy. So we, we don't do any computation that is unnecessary. The, the, the driving of the, the computation is is done by the by the, the sync of the, the pipeline, not at, at, at any intermediate step. So again, we see that we're we're getting very close to what Doug McElroy showed in that Unix script uh, shell script uh, of, of, of of succinct and beauty of expressing the idea using primitives that compose well with each other without any boilerplate on or semantics that needs to glue them together other than the beautiful pipe. So another example here of, of uh, chaining such transformations and filters and views. And yeah, the classic interview question as well. I was amused about this one. I saw it in a recent C++ weekly episode, splitting the uh, splitting strings, of course. So it's uh, all about pipelines and uh, very quickly, taking inspiration from Dag McElroy and his famous uh, 70s script. Um, yes, we can do this in C++. Uh, it's not as short as uh, Doug's script, but um, I, I, I think folks might, might be able to improve it. Um, so this would be, uh, I expanded this a bit to be more readable, but uh, it, it can be done more succinctly in terms of syntax, but even uh, maybe a clev more clever idea. Uh, and if you remember 
Uh, this person from my uh, history voyage at the beginning of the presentation, when I, I talked about the, the FP uh, family and FP lineage of, of Haskell, and I talked about uh, Phil Wadler and uh, uh, his contributions with type classes and monads uh, to Haskell. Uh, and I didn't have any time to go into type classes today, uh, but um, I promised I'm going to do uh, follow-up uh, presentations that will go in-depth on in some of the subjects. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this idea, and the idea is that uh, uh, his quote, make your code readable, pretend the next person who looks at your code is a psychopath, and they know where you live. And uh, I'm channeling uh, Ivan here. Uh, he always likes to end his talks this way, and I totally stole this from him. Because uh, I, I think it delivers the strong message that I wanted and that the idea is that programming in a functional way and composing uh, computations out of small semantic elements that deliver a message help you uh, maintain a code base easier and help others understand your intent rather than dealing with uh, the minutiae of variables and using a debugger or a logger to figure out what the program does. So... That would be the takeaway uh, from this presentation is to um, strive for delivering more uh, semantics with your code, not just uh, state and variables. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm sure excited about the rest of the, the agenda. Um, I have a, a schedule built for myself. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I invite you to join the, the Discord channel from our team, the Visual C++ team at Microsoft, take our survey. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few sessions from um, uh, my teammates. Uh, these would be uh, the ones uh, throughout the week. Um, so I highly recommend that you attend them. Uh, some of them have very interesting news. And with that, uh, I wish you all a very pleasant CppCon 2020.